Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. The name Trinity Sunday might be somewhat misleading because it can kind of give you the impression that there's only supposed to be one day in the whole church year that we as Christians turn our hearts and minds to the contemplation of the one true God in three co-eternal, co-equal persons. Now granted, today on Trinity Sunday, we do hopefully do some heavy duty reflection on what it means for God to be three in one, followed by that very equally heavy duty creed, the Athanasian Creed. It's a great creed, by the way. I wish we said it more often. You will find though that many Christians are quick to acknowledge the incomprehensibility of the whole thing. You know, the God is so far beyond our understanding that we might as well just get through the Athanasian Creed. And by the time you get to the end of it, you say, well, that's over for the year. Don't lie. Don't lie. The other thing that's not particularly encouraging is that sooner or later you find out that some of those analogies that people have made up to explain the Trinity are all like most sermon illustrations. They are pretty bad, and none of them really cut it, because they try to explain something that cannot be explained. There is no analogy to the Trinity. So you've, I'm sure at some point in your life you've heard these things, hopefully not from the pulpit, but the Trinity is like a three-leafed clover. Or you've heard that the Trinity is kind of like the three forms of water, something like that. But the Athanasian Creed and the Holy Scriptures don't let us settle for analogies like these. Because we do not worship one God, one God in three parts. That would be the shamrock analogy. We do not worship one God in three forms. You know, like water freezing into ice or evaporating into mist. So with that in mind, let's just say the Athanasian Creed and be done with it. Yeah, we can't quite be done with it. We can't be done with the Godhead of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You know that our liturgy and our hymnody is chock full of praise and glory that's rendered to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Every divine service begins with the invocation of the Trinity in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The assurance that our sins are forgiven, the absolution that is pronounced, is also given to us in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then when you read the New Testament, most every page, somewhere on the page, has references to each of these three. And so the Son of the Father is conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The Son, when he's baptized, he is declared and acclaimed to be the Son of the Father. And the same Holy Spirit descends on him to anoint him. At his cross, when Jesus dies, we see uh, the fulfillment of what Jesus had spoken of earlier, that God, the Father, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It is the Son who breathes his life-giving Holy Spirit on his disciples from his cross and then later in the upper room. So where would Christianity be without the Holy Trinity? Well, we can't do without the Trinity because the Trinity is not an artifact from late antiquity. It is not a theory and it is not an opinion. The Trinity is God and God is the Trinity. Unless the Father sent the Son to seek and to save that which was lost, and unless the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, we cannot have the Father as our own. We do not have Jesus as our Savior. Without the Trinity, we could not worship the one true God, and there is only one. I find that one reason that the Athanasian Creed has waned in its popularity, because in fact, I'm sure this will shock you, Pretty much the only church that continues to confess the Athanasian Creed would be the Lutheran Church. It's on the books in other churches, 
But I think uh, people become rather uncomfortable when their life and their teaching is not tethered to the Word of God because they don't want to confess anything too specific about God that would exclude somebody else who does not worship the one true God. The business about eternal damnation is also rather unsettling to some people. Uh, not particularly to me, because that's what God said. The Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity is to be worshipped. And the key to worshipping and believing in the Trinity is actually not what most people think it is. Knowing that God is three in one is not a matter of fitting the Trinity into your brain, much in the same way that Christianity is not a matter of accepting Jesus into your heart. The gospel is not a matter of you accepting Jesus. The gospel is Jesus accepting you. And the same is true of the Trinity. We don't keep the Catholic faith whole and undefiled by rationalizing it and trying to shove it into our brains. We don't, we are not saved by getting the Trinity into our minds, but we are saved by getting into the Trinity. And as always, the only way for that to make sense is to hear the words of Jesus. At the close of Matthew's gospel today, the Lord has summoned the 11 apostles to a mountain in Galilee. This is after Jesus has been raised from the dead and he's about to ascend into heaven. You'll notice that the apostles also can't quite wrap their minds around something. It is the fact that the Son of God is raised from the dead. Because St. Matthew tells us when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And perhaps it could be that even though they see Jesus living and triumphant, it still strikes them 40 days later after his resurrection that it is just too good to be true. Or it could be that they wavered and they ask or they want to know what is going to happen next. And Jesus declares to them all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Very soon, Jesus ascends to rule and to reign. And this is actually something that he has done from all eternity. Jesus has ruled and reigned from all eternity according to his divine nature, which is equal with that of his father's. But now that Jesus has been raised, and now that he's going to ascend into heaven, his risen and ascended flesh will be glorified so that when he sits down at the right hand of the Father, enthroned in that glory, he will reign according to his human nature as well. We worship a man because that man is God. And so it's on this authority that Jesus sends his apostles out, and he instructs them to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And here's how to worship the Trinity and unity and unity and Trinity to keep the Catholic faith whole and undefiled. It's all in the name. Everything is in the name. It is helpful to know, too, that when Jesus says go and baptize in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, that little three letter Greek preposition, it's pronounced ace. It is by me. That's the southern pronunciation. Ace. An ace which is translated as in is also equally legitimately translated as into. Baptize them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And this highlights the point then that it is not that we invite the Trinity into our minds, that we only accept the proposition after much rationalizing and scrutiny. It's not that, but rather it's that we are plunged into the divine life of the Trinity when we are baptized into its name. We take that plunge in the waters of baptism. It's that baptismal formula that Jesus gives, which ties all of these things together. Now up to this point, even at the time of the ascension, the disciples know this much about Jesus, their rabbi. 
They know that he has a special relationship with God that nobody else has. They know that he is led by the Holy Spirit. But now it all comes together. The relationship between these three and then the relationship between God and us. There is one name, singular. There are not three different names to God. And the risen Jesus whom they call Lord, they call him Lord rightly. They worship at this man's feet rightly because you would have to ask yourself when you encounter the person of Jesus, who else would have all authority in heaven and on earth but God? And who else would be the ultimate teacher who makes disciples except God himself? Who else has the power to cancel sin and to blot out death except God? And for good reason, despite their doubts, the disciples worship at the feet of this man because this man is God, just as the Father and the Holy Spirit are. Now, as we've said, the nature of God is not something that you arrive at intellectually. It's not something that you scrutinize and analyze and then decide if you're going to believe it or not. Knowing God is being in his name. It's having his name placed upon you. It is living in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all of your life. Knowing God is kind of like falling in love. It is not a carefully rational process, but it is taking a plunge. And we know God as Father only when we become his children, only when he becomes our Father. We know the Son as the Son of God and as our brother only when we as sons of God by faith are adopted into the family. We only know God the Holy Spirit when he draws us into that life that he shares with the Father and the Son, when he washes us in his triune name. That is the way to know God. Just add water. That's all it takes. And Jesus is very clear before he ascends that baptism really does take with everybody, anybody and everybody, men and women and boys and girls of all ages, the smart and the slow, the old and the newborn. Baptism works for everybody. And being washed and regenerated, being baptized into God's name, puts us in him. And it puts us right into the family. It puts us in relationship to the Father, through the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And their life is in us because our life is in them. Baptizing is then followed by this, Jesus says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And this is one of the great joys of being a disciple, is that you can spend a lifetime doing it, and you will spend your entire life still learning to know God. Now, it is true that you are as much a child of God when you emerge dripping from this font as when you are where you are today. It is analogous. I'll make one analogy if that's okay. It's analogous to being the parents of your children or you, you being a child of your parents, that you are as much your parents' child at nine days gestation as you are 90 years old. And yet there is something happens as you grow and as you develop. And I have many of those joys to look forward to. But when you get to be 90 years old, you have deepened that relationship with your parents that you had when they were alive. That our relationship grows. We grow into our identity and it deepens. And it is the same with God because he does not only command us to be baptized, but he commands us to be taught. And the thing that's true of you and your parents is true of your relationship with your heavenly father. God desires to nourish and to strengthen baptism. This is why he gives us the teaching of his word. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. 
And so the incomprehensibility of the Trinity is not a roadblock to you knowing God. It is actually an invitation. Baptized into his name, it is true that you can't even begin to plumb the depths of who God is. To know what is the breadth and length and height and depth and the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. And yet he calls us to keep the Catholic faith whole and undefiled. We keep the faith because God keeps us. And all of our life that we live, we live in the name of the one who washed away all of our sins, the name into which we are baptized. And that name that gives us forgiveness is the name that we will praise and glorify forever and ever when our baptism is completed and our resurrection is accomplished. And may the one true God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be glorified now and forever and unto ages of ages. Amen.